Greetings everyone and welcome back again. Today I'm going to show you how to use your Raspberry Pi as a retro gaming machine using RetroArch and a graphical front end called Emulation Station. So I'll show you how to use the scripts from the RetroPie project which will install everything you need, how to add the games to the folder structure and then launch them, then I'll just run through a little bit of gameplay footage just to show you how it runs. As before, I'll be using a fresh build of Raspbian. The one I'm using this time is dated 16th to the 12th, 2012. So boot up your preferred imaging program, select the image file and write it to the SD card. I use Win32 Disk Imager for this. For more information about that, see my last video where I show you where to get it from. Once it's loaded onto the SD card, pop it into the Raspberry Pi and power it up. Just like last time, I'm going to be using the remote client putty to run most of the commands, mainly for clarity. So in the Raspi config window, at the initial boot, I scroll down to SSH and make sure it's enabled to allow a remote connection. Again, I talked through this more in my last video, so if you want to use putty yourself, check it out for more details. I'll just quickly grab the IP address with the command ifconfig so we can connect. Now I'll put that IP into putty, then the username and password, and we are ready to begin. First, install git dialog with sudo apt-get install-y git dialog. This will take a couple of minutes. Now what we're going to do is use a custom set of scripts written by the author of petrockblog.com. It's been written so that it downloads, compiles and installs all of the emulators, creates the folder structure and installs the graphical front end to launch the games from. Next, type git clone dash dash depth equals zero and then the address which is git colon forward slash forward slash github.com forward slash petrock blog forward slash retro pi dash setup dot git. When typing these couple of commands now, caps do matter, so be careful when you're typing it in. Then move to the correct folder with cd retropy setup. In there, type the command chmod plus x retropy underscore setup dot sh. And then run that file with sudo dot forward slash retropy underscore setup dot sh. Now it tells you that there's not enough space available and I've done it this way to show you what to do when you get this message. So say no to this question, then enter the raspi config window again with the command sudo raspi config. In here, go down to the second option, expand root fs and select it. Obviously, if you're installing a fresh build of Linux, you can do this at the beginning like in the same place where I enabled SSH, rather than doing it here. This requires a reboot, so what we'll do is finish off the last couple of commands on the Pi instead of on the remote terminal. So put in your username and password and run those same commands again. cd retropy setup then chmod plus x retropy underscore setup dot sh and lastly sudo dot forward slash retropy underscore setup dot sh here we are in the pre-install menu and what we want to do is install so select the first option here install and update 
This menu tells you what it's all about. You can select which emulators and which libraries you want to install. So as you can see there are options for installing updates, generating a folder structure, installing RetroArch and then all of the options for all the different emulators. You can select or deselect any of these by pressing the spacebar on any of them. By default this will install everything and it is the recommended option. It will download, compile and install everything so you guarantee the latest versions and that's the plus point. And it's also the option that I'm using so hit OK to proceed. The only downside, it takes a long time and I mean a long time. I've done it twice now, each time taking around about 6 hours or so. So set it up and go out for the day or leave it running overnight. OK we're done and as you can see it's considerably darker than when we first started. First it tells you that a log has been generated and you can view that at the shown location. Hit OK and you'll go through to this dialog box. This gives you a brief overview of how to start some emulators. However, there are some that work right out of the box with this, which is what we'll focus on for now. So we'll do exactly what the next window says after a quick reboot. To start the front end, type emulation station. As you'll see, even before we put the ROMs in the folders, there are two options here already, Doom and Duke Nukem 3D. We'll ignore these for now and exit by hitting F1, then choosing Exit. We need to add some ROMs to the folders created for us, and the easiest way to do that is in the desktop environment. So type Start X to get to that. Once here, open up the file manager and go to RetroPie and then ROMs. I'm just going to use a USB stick to transfer the files across. Open it up and start transferring the ROMs into the relevant folders. These ones that I'm doing are the ones that work right away without any tweaking. Super Nintendo, Nintendo, Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance. All Nintendo, how strange. Anyway, once it's done, run Emulation Station again. But you need to log out of the desktop environment first, otherwise you'll get this message. So hit log out from this menu, then run the command emulation station again. This time when you scroll through the menus there are more options. The same options as where we just placed the ROMs. So let's take a quick look at some gameplay. Unfortunately Doom doesn't work right away. I'm assuming there's some sort of WAD file you need. I've seen that problem before when trying to run Doom on the Nintendo DS. But Duke Nukem does work and I have to say it runs really smoothly and loads quickly and the sound emulation is excellent even through my tiny monitor speakers. I didn't have much luck with the Game Boy Advance, it was really slow and juttery. I even tried some other games off camera and it still had the same problem. I probably just need to tweak the settings slightly. The others were all fine. Nintendo, Super Nintendo and Game Boy Color all worked perfectly. I was using a keyboard to control them using the cursors 
and the Z and X buttons mainly. It's not ideal but you can probably configure a gamepad for them. I'll leave this footage running as I sign off and tell you that there are links in the description to all of the resources used including of course Petrock Blog's entry as I mentioned at the start of the video. So have fun and thanks for watching.